Welcome to all of those that are worshiping online with us at Bush Lake and at Woodside. And for all of us in the room, man, I just want to turn the lights up and see who are you? Where did you all come from? In my last service, I said, does anybody have a special expression in their new freedom? And a guy stood up and threw up his mask. It was a graduation party with his cap. It was just <laughs> tremendous. But it's great to see you and glad we can be together. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 1611. It's a very simple verse. It says, in your mighty right hand, O Lord, is the fullness of joy. And it just speaks to me all of the time as we wrap up this series called Thrive, that if there's any thriving or any boundless joy that you hope to have in your life, it's found only in the mighty right hand of God. You can find other joy, but not the fullness of joy that is the longing of your heart. So as we wrap up this series Thrive today, we've been looking at seven different arenas of our life, hoping to integrate them more holistically. We looked at family and friends. We looked at future and fun and fitness and faith. And today we're going to wrap up with finances. And it's a proper way to end because uh, according to all the national polls, it's still the number one vexing concern of people in America. It's still the number one stressor in marriage relationships. It's still a primary indicator of our emotional well-being or lack thereof. Peter Drucker says that one of the essential characteristics of a leader or those who want an effective life is their ability to define reality and then do something about it. It's one thing for us to define reality. We tend to land on that one okay. It's the doing something about it where we get a little bit confused, not sure which direction to go. I'm going to encourage you to take out a pen. I'm going to give you several resources that I believe might be of helpful, help um, to you today, or you can take out your phone if you want to do notes there. Many people do notes on phone. I know you're not looking at anything else, so it's fine. Just go ahead, do it. Um, I want to do three things today. I want to help you define your reality so then you can consider how you might move forward doing something about it. I want to briefly just speak to the dangers of money that you already know in your heart, just want to remind you of them. And then I want to land in most of my words around one key thing that leads to financial thriving. So let's begin by defining reality. The Good Sense Organization research um, does research with uh, churches all across America, and they recently did scan our country and found some actually upside news that there are a good number of people who are experiencing financial freedom. They're actually thriving. They define thriving or financial freedom as being aware of learning the principles of Scripture, how to steward them to the end, that it doesn't benefit you alone, but the kingdom of God as well. That's how they define it. But then their research shows the downside that the majority of people still struggle to thrive or to find financial freedom. And there are several scenarios by which they help us define that reality. Let me touch on three of them. If yours isn't financial freedom, it might be one of these three. Scenario number one, you're underwater. That is, you struggle to make ends meet. That there is, in fact, too much month at the end of your money. And you have more money going out than can satisfy the obligations or the lifestyle that you've chosen. You have major consumer debt, perhaps, or you're consistently in a place of worry about finances and wonder if there will ever be a rainbow somewhere for you to move toward where that freedom could be yours. And if that's your scenario, you need stability. You need to understand with clarity exactly what is coming in and what is going out each month. The need, just like any other discipleship arena, is both spiritual and practical. In this particular scenario, it means that you'll likely have to differentiate between needs and wants. You probably have more going toward the wants than you have the resources to go in that direction. So you've got to define that reality in your life, in your journey. And practically, you'll need wise financial planning in order to manage what is truly coming in against that which is going out. The scenario number two is treading water. Here, you may not even be aware that you have a problem because month to month, you're making ends meet. And you might even be taking off a little debt and might even be putting a little in saving in your journey, but you're only surviving. You're not thriving. You're not experiencing the financial freedom that is the longing of your heart. If that's your scenario, you need clarity. 
in how to be free by understanding um, what you have and that God gave it to you and how it could move into places of greater freedom. What's next in that journey? So spiritually, you, you begin to see yourself as a steward of what God has given. You just know it belongs to him and you wanna maximize that in your life journey. And practically, you start to set goals accordingly with a plan to help get you there. Scenario number three, you're swimming. You're really doing well financially. You have all that you need to meet all of your needs and still you don't feel financial freedom because you are burdened with this thing called worry. Will you have enough in your life and your journey? And worry has caused some of you to want to earn more and save more because you find your security more in the money than other realities. And you can miss out on the abundant life of God. And if that's your scenario, um, then you need legacy. A new filter by which you look at what you've been given. The past feelings of financial insecurity must be gone. And you begin to see that it's God who gave you all those resources that allow you to be in the place that you're at. And you give them to him understanding that spiritually he wants you to have a contentment that he's going to provide for you. But also you have a gratitude that he has provided as much as he has provided. That your security is not going to be in your money. It's going to be in him. So practically you need a financial plan that helps you maximize those resources with an understanding that God gave it to you anyways and that he intends for you to use them for his kingdom purposes. Now you start to plan for the kingdom purposes and you have this overwhelming sense of privilege once you start to plan in this given way. So are you financial, financially free? Well, we want to say God bless you if you're in that given place. Um, or are you treading water or underwater or swimming? Define your reality, whatever it is, do something about it. We want to help and bring hope wherever we can. We're partnering with Crown Financial to do that. Um, if you go to our webpage, we put it right there on the homepage. That's our top three options. It's really easy to get to, um, to find the resources from Crown Financial in one of two arenas. In the fall, we're going to be offering a class. You can sign up now for that class and journey together with others in what's really a fun learning experience together. Or if your need is so great, you can't wait for the fall class, if you go to that site, you can independently work and define your reality and put a plan forward. They will provide those resources and coaching materials are all there, so I encourage you to take advantage of that. I hope you know that thriving begins here, that stewardship is profoundly spiritual before it's ever financial. So there might have to be a paradigm shift just on that given truth, that any resources we have are a sacred trust from God because all that I am and all that I have is from him. And he created us with this intent to steward those resources of our lives holistically and financially to the end that yes, we would thrive personally, but that we would be about seeing others thrive or needs that get met, that God always intended an other-centered approach to our financial resources, not just for ourselves. The Bible is really quite positive about money and yet, at the same time, it speaks clearly about the dangers of money. And I just want to say, these things are just reminders for you. I know that in your heart, in your mind, you know these things to be true. But I think because the scripture says so much about them, um, because God sees the, the condition of our heart, he wants us to be reminded again that money has the power to afflict us with envy. We want what other people have to the end that we would even allow great debt in order to get what we want, which then binds us from being other-centered with those resources. And we know the danger that money afflicts us with greed, that we have this intense desire for more. And we fail to ask the question, when is enough enough? That would be a great question for Americans, particularly the wealthiest country in the world, still strapped down with so much financial stress to ask, when is enough or enough, because we have this, my little axiom around it is comparison kills. We compare to others and all of a sudden we find ourselves wanting it and we have this greed that takes over and you know the real dark side of greed, it, it moves us toward dishonesty in order to cover our tracks and even corruption. It's been for centuries part of the challenge of humanity. And then the danger that money afflicts us with gluttony. We just keep consuming even when we're full even when our needs are met. And we all wrestle with this in some way, we really do. I don't know why I always get the extra taco. I don't need the extra taco. 
I'm more than satisfied with the, the two that I get. Why do I put the third? There's something, we just want to consume more, and we bring that into money. So you know, at the heart of it all, money just leads or reveals our selfishness. And that's a hard thing, to look into the mirror at our own selfishness. But you already know that. You already know that. So it's just a reminder to you. But there might be a couple dangers you may not know about. One of the dangers is simply that it wrecks what's most important, the relationships that matter most, that God wants us to attend to. I got this note from a young guy. Mom, my mom and dad sink into the seas of consumer indebtedness. It makes them have to work harder and longer, and they have little time for each other and us until there is not much of family at all right now. There's a house, just not a home. There's a common address, but not much community, and it's all because of money. It just kind of hits you. We, we lose track of what's most important, our quest to have it, and then spend it, and then to maintain it. And you may not know this either, that money distorts your sense of safety. That sometimes when you've been given a lot of money, you have this false sense of security around the money that you have. And I was reminded of this just this week. Um, in my world, I try to manage my world as best I possibly can. There are a lot of things that come that I'm not in control of, like pandemics, but also like death. So I officiated a funeral. I can't plan for when those funerals happen. Happened at the end of the week for a 23-year-old young gal. And I'm telling you, it was so brutal. <laughs> Unexpected loss. Died a week ago. Service on Friday. And I'm telling you, all of us are humbled. See, if you take the reality of what money is, it can't stop tragedy. It can't stop heartache. It cannot stop um, death from coming our way or an unexpected illness. No, safety is indeed in the mighty right hand of God. The fullness of joy is in his presence and his presence alone. But these things are good reminders. The Bible actually offers us 500 verses, that is, on the subject of prayer and 500 verses on the subject of faith and 2,300 verses on the subject of money. Because God knows the condition of our heart. He knows, and this is why he speaks so directly about it, that it is fundamental to the core condition of our heart and the choices that we make today that will impact next year and the next decade of our lives. And so Jesus says in Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's why it's not a money thing. It's a heart thing. It starts with God being Priority, number one, in our hearts. And when he is number one in our hearts, you'll find the key to financial thriving is in becoming a grace giver. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that terminology that the New Testament gives to us, but we are grace givers, which simply means we're like God. Be holy as God is holy, we're told in this scripture. Be a grace giver because God is a grace, grace giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. This is a giving God who's made us, who breathed life into us in our life and our journey. So we're made in the image of God and he intends us to be grace givers in the whole of our lives and in the financial stewardship of our lives. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know it teaches the principle of tithing. The New Testament teaches the principle of grace giving out of the proportion that you've been given, you give unto the Lord and to the purposes that he has for you. That grace giving becomes something that we learn. We learn it over time. I'm just confessing to you that I've had to learn it over time. When I made God number one through faith in Jesus Christ in my late teens and then to my early 20s, I still had a lot to learn about what it meant to be a grace giver. I was then just dating Carrie. We were not yet married, but she would begin the journey of this discovery of grace giving for me because um, she didn't have much money. I didn't have much money, but I was, you know, compassionate. She needed some help to put gas in her car, so I gave her 20 bucks. We went to church that Sunday, and she put 20 bucks in the offering plate, but she didn't have 20 bucks except for the 20 bucks that I gave to her. It created some conversation is what I'm saying, okay? And out of that conversation, um, she would put words to the influence of her mom and dad who taught her how to give out of the little or much you've been given based on the word of God. It would create a foundation of learning and understanding for us that has been really quite helpful. And then you read the scriptures and you find really what the legs of grace giving looks like in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, which reveals the grace giving kind of way. Let me give you some context for this. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ spread from Jerusalem and it went to, it started with the Jewish people and went to the Gentiles and surrounding nations to Macedonia, which is where we would call, what we call modern day Greece today. And the conditions, because of persecution in Jerusalem, had become absolutely horrific. And these new Christ followers, I mean new Christ followers, Gentiles, who had hated the Jewish people, the Jewish people who hated the Gentiles of Macedonia, but they've come to faith in Christ, they see themselves at the foot of the same cross, and they have this burden, the Macedonians, in their poverty for the need of the Jewish people who are in Jerusalem experiencing this persecution. And as a result of that, they decide to be, give us the example of grace giving. And what I'd like to do is uh, look at these beautiful Christians um, and how grace giving consumed them with five qualities that I pulled. There's probably more. I pulled out five that just stood out to me powerfully with the hope that you could answer the question when you leave here, am I a grace giver? And how do you know? Well, these five qualities help you know more detail. First of all, you give to increase the reputation of Jesus Christ and not just your own reputation. Is your money about you and all that you want to do or is Jesus the center of it? Is he the center of who you are, what you have, how you live, and what you give? Beginning at verse one of chapter eight. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become poor rich. You know, the world identifies net worth through financial numbers, dollars. But here we see something different, that the real net worth in God's eyes is the price that he paid for each of our lives when he gave to us Jesus Christ. That's what happened to these Macedonian Christ followers. They received Christ. And when they gave, they gave knowing that Jesus had made them rich where once they were poor. Is your giving about Jesus when it comes to your family and friends and your future and um, your fun and your fitness, let Jesus be the center of these things? Number two quality, you give generously and cheerfully, not stingily or grudgingly. That is, we can do more together than ever we could do alone. God leverages it, um, the little that we have, to have profound impact. That was their experience in verse two. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, simply saying that the collective whole was greater than anything they could have imagined when their giving was done in harmony and unison with the rest of the Christ followers. And I love the personal object, uh, adjectives that you find here. You find severe trial accompanying with overflowing joy. You find extreme poverty accompanying, accompanying with rich generosity. These are paradoxes that happen when God is in, um, we're in, we're in the mighty right hand of God. That boundless joy is, is happening here. So the collective whole was more than they themselves could really imagine. I just take a step back and pause on that. Can I just invite you to look in the mirror for a moment? If you have food in your fridge, if you have clothes on your back, which by the way, thank you for dressing today. <laughs> If you have a roof over your head and a place to sleep, do you know that you are richer than 78% of people in the world? And if you have any money in the bank or any money in your wallet, you are among the 8% richest people in the world. Boy, there's a paradigm shift. Look at your neighbor and just tell them right now, you're rich. Just take a moment and do it, you're rich. Yeah, let, let's, I think we just have to remind each other because we feel like we need to have so much more. No, you're rich. We're a rich, rich people, and that's a gift. Here we have the Macedonians. We're the poor of the poor in the world, and they were grace givers. Is your giving joy joyfully generous? And then third, you give voluntarily and as privilege, not under obligation or burden. That is, grace giving... Um, 
sees giving as an opportunity to seize, not just a problem to solve. And they had done just that. They don't want to miss out on it, beginning in verse 3 again. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded um, with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. I just love this picture. They were the poor of the poor Christians, urgently pleading, not for something to come to them, but for them to give something to somebody else in greater need than they themselves were in. That's grace giving. It goes beyond our own plight, our own um, suffering and challenge to say, no, I can be part of the good in the world that the world truly needs. They see a need, they meet the need. Is your giving considered a privilege on your part? That's grace giving. It emphasizes the following in the fourth, that you give because you want to, not because you have to. That is, as you put your faith in Christ, there are these GPs, these God promptings that begin to well up and he increases awareness and I go, oh Lord, you're wanting me to step in and to do something about this opportunity, this situation. You want to do it. The Lord is stirring it in you. Verse 10, last year you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. You're not only the first, these poorest of the poor to give, you're the first to want to do it, to make a difference. And you've raised your hand and say, count on us. We want to be part of this. This is the pitter-patter of God's heart. It always is. I love the passage in Peter that says that, that God desires that no one should perish. He, he wants to give life to everybody. He's just a giver at every front. He wants to give. And he made us in his image to want to give as well. Do you want to give? And then fifth, you give out of your ability, not out of your wishability. God instructs us to give out of what he's given us, not out of what he's not given us. Is there not freedom in that? Because again, comparison kills. We look at what others give and we try to keep up with them, but it's not my means. I just have to celebrate what God has given me. These are my means in verse 11. Now finish the work according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. It's not an acceptable gift if you're giving out of something you don't have. He, he's provided for you. If you acknowledge that what you have is his, you give out of what he's given you. I find great freedom in that. Encourage you to delete the voice that simply says, I wish I could give more. You don't have to think that way. Give out of the means that you've been given. Otherwise, a couple of things will happen. You won't give at all because you'll start to think, well, my 10 bucks doesn't make a difference. So you don't give. It feels so small. How could it make a dent? No, the collective, God leverages the collective generosity of his people. Or secondly, you start to feel guilt because you can't give more. And then that moves to sadness. But giving is to be about joy and gladness. It's a different way of thinking grace giving is. So is your giving out of your ability? Base it on your, what you have, not what you don't have. And I just say this because it's a tender place. It means we may have to do some prioritization. That is, it may be that God has not been the priority in your life and you find yourself burdened by too much house and too much stuff and the call of the Lord then is to move to greater simplicity and to begin that journey and watch how your hands open and freedom comes because you're managing in the means that he's given and you're keeping him in mind and others in mind as you do. So just start that process, which by the way, grace giving is a multiplier. Once you enter into this place, it's a multiplier. I wish I could dedicate a whole message just on this, but from chapter nine, let me give you three quick ones. It meets genuine needs and so much more. Verse 12, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. That is, needs are getting met and thankfulness is going up, which in increases the reputation of the Lord. Secondly, inspires great generosity. Generosity begets generosity. Verse two, for I know your eagerness to help and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action because of what they hear, they wanna be part of it. And that happens to us as well. I have in my pocket um, a dollar bill that came from Todd. This has been in my desk drawer since 2008. You remember that was the economic crisis for those who were around at that time. We were building phase two of our Chanhassen campus and we had to recalibrate 
and we did half of what we had intended to do because of that economic crisis. But we did all we could do by faith. Still, not sure what would be ahead, but God believing we, he would provide for us. Our son was 10 years of age. His name is Blake at the time. And his best friend in our neighborhood was Todd. Todd does not come to Westwood. His family didn't come to Westwood. His family didn't even attend a church. But Blake had told Todd about what we're doing and Todd came over, knocked on the door, and asked for Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Didn't ask for Blake, he asked for Mr. Johnson. I love those glory days. <laughs> and the respect of a child, I mean, it's pretty cool. So I come to the door, hi, Mr. Johnson. He said, I heard you're building a new facility. I want to participate, here's a dollar. I've kept this dollar, and Carrie and I gave more. Because generosity begets generosity. And then third, it rewards now and in eternity. Let me just say, you want to be a grace giver. Because what comes to you in the now is so extraordinary. And what is promised when this life is over, which is in his hands, is extraordinary. Just take in these words, chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You see the thriving there. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Count me in. I want to be a grace giver. There's some good news for today and for eternity. And you might ask the question when it comes to God first giving promises of God promised blessings, does he promise you financial wealth and richness if you give? Can I say this? Absolutely no. Some of you may experience that. That is not the promise of Scripture. And that teaching, which is happening in the church around the world today, needs to be negated. That is not a promise from God. He says, yes, you will be enlarged in your life in so many great ways in a harvest of faith. You will know the presence of God. Therein lies the best riches in your journey today and forevermore. That's the promise that he makes to us. That's the promise that Megan accepted when she said, um, I'll say yes to the 90-day challenge for those who are newer to us. Before the pandemic set in, in January 2020, we did a five-week series on the 90-day challenge. God promised um, giving, bringing about God promised blessings. And the challenge was for 90 days, if you have never, never tithed, not everybody could step into that challenge, but start a tithe for 90 days and see how God would bless Megan was one of them who said yes. This is her story. In 2019, God really called on my heart to start giving to the church, to him, consistently. I was giving $10 a month, and that was hard because I was a student. I would be starting my field work positions and going in 10, about 10 months with no job that year. But it is what God put on my heart for that year. In 2020, I am working at a temporary position and I go to church and we are prompted with the 90 day challenge. I feel called even more that this is the next step in giving consistently. So COVID hits and I'm working at a clinic and I just started tithing, right? We're told that we're going into lockdown, meaning our clinic would transfer to telehealth services and we would be losing a significant amount of clients. I continue to tithe because there's things that I know that are for certain and that's that he always provides for our needs. He always has and he always will. When I started giving consistently, I had places to live for free during my internship. I devoted my life to Christ that Easter and got baptized here. And I wouldn't know it that night, but I met my husband at baptism. I got temporary work that fall and into 2020 to carry me until I found a full-time position. And I got engaged and married. So 
it's been a journey that I'm grateful for and I am thankful that I continued to persevere because that's faith, like not being certain, but trusting in God. Romans 8.31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Whatever mountains I may face, I know that he will move them. And that verse just really captivates me and helps me know that there's peace with tithing, with trusting in him um, when I give up control. story. I, I met Megan at the Christmas light show we did in the drive through and I was at the, the exit and she stopped by and introduced herself. I'm Megan. Um, my, this is my husband. She was really glad to introduce me to him and said, I, I came to faith um, here at Westwood. I was baptized on Easter. Um, he was baptized at the same Easter service, but we didn't meet each other. We didn't know each other. And we went on a social dating app site. We met each other and learned that we were baptized at the same service. And I go, what a great promo for baptism services. <laughs> <laughs> the benefits are so great. You just never know where this will land. But, you know, I love her story and the fact that she said yes and um, if you're interested in the 90-day challenge, we want to encourage you. We put it at our website. Again, it's another resource available. I'll intersect with you over the course of the summer if you want to give it a shot for 90 days, see how God might bless. I want to take a moment before we're done here just to say thank you for your generosity um, through this pandemic. It's been an extraordinarily challenging time. A lot of questions. Will we make payroll? All these things that companies and churches have been dealing with it's expected that one out of five evangelical churches will close as a result of the pandemic. One out of three mainline churches will close. Just not enough sustainable resources. And you have demonstrated grace giving on so many fronts. And I want to personally thank you for that. We're well. We're doing well. Um, and I'm also mindful of the reality that those who did say yes, we had prayed in January of 2020 before the pandemic hit that 200 people would participate in the 90 day challenge, 333 did. And the differential of that giving helped us get through the year. Also, all of your giving did because we had to make a big move as all churches did to online giving. Over 50% of you went online when you had not been online. It made a difference. And as we move forward, we want to invite you to continue to give. There's um, Church Futurists speaking about a revival, an awakening happening this fall as people re-enter that there's an openness to the Spirit of God. So we're planning for revival for this fall. <laughs> continue to give to the work of the Lord and all that he wants to do. I just want you to know how grateful I am for it. Also, I want to encourage you to take a growth-giving next step. Throughout the years, if you're newer to Westwood, you wouldn't be familiar with what we call the ladder of generosity. Start where you are, define your reality, and then begin to move. You may not be able to get to a tithe, but if, if, you're, if you've never given, begin. It's astonishing to me how many people consider Westwood their church home, but you don't participate in the financial opportunity to serve the purposes here. Start. If it's five bucks, ten bucks, just get into the game and start. Some of you give occasionally at Christmas or Easter, and that's beneficial or special situations. And if that's your way. There might be reasons why that's your way, but we would consider taking a step up to intentional giving. We are consistently making a difference. The, the online stability that has come to us has been extraordinary, and I want to encourage you to let that be an act of worship, to become an intentional giver. And then if you can move into that tithing place, you enter realms of financial freedom that are extraordinary, that leave to the extraordinary. We encourage you to take a step up wherever you might be, to define that reality, knowing that God is with you in it all the way. So fun to be a grace giver. We invite you to do that. Well, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close together in prayer and receive these words. Lord, every time I give, I remind myself that you are God, that you are real, that you are first, not me and not money. And every time I give, I reinforce that all I am and all I have is from you. And every time I give, I declare I will trust you, God, even when trusting doesn't feel easy or come naturally. Every time I give, I'm reminded to count my blessings, my treasures, um, as coming from you, 
and leading to what's most important. Every time I give, I am reminded that you are present with us and provide for our every need. Every time I give, I declare you are worthy to be praised. Thank you for your generosity, oh Lord. We praise you, amen.